Hey, welcome. It's so good to have you join us for uh, worship online, for church online. Wherever you are, it's so good that we are able to have this time together. I don't know what life is like for you at the moment, but my prayer is that uh, through this time together that you would be encouraged and you would be strengthened to be able to look to whatever it is uh, that is before you and be able to see beyond that to the one who holds all things in the palm of his hand. You know, as we open up the scriptures together, I want to begin by saying that if you're watching this and you are caught up in the anxieties of life, I, I fully understand with the pandemic and the way that it's just uh, r right around the world at the moment, it's causing people to be anxious. It's created economic uncertainty. We have so much political uncertainty around the world at the moment that it's only natural that that, that anxiety would be reflected in our lives. And, and my prayer is that that we would rise above that because I want you to understand something really important. Whether you remember anything else, it's, it's this, that whatever is going on in your life right now, is not a reflection or an expression of your worth. Your worth is not determined by circumstances. Your worth is not determined by the opinions of others. Your worth has already been determined uh, by the creator of the heavens and the earth who looked down when he created you and says, uh, I'm going to give the heavens best for you. You see, your value is determined by the one who made you, not by the things of this world. And, and no matter what you have lost, no matter what you are worried about, no matter what is going on in your life right now, these things do not determine your value. They are simply expressions of life. But the one who created you, he's already spoken your value. He's already determined your worth. And he said you are worth everything everything. So uh, that's my encouragement for you. I hope that as we go through this morning, that if, if that speaks to you, then um, you would be encouraged to reach for more. For the rest of us, uh, I thank you for just making the time to open up the scriptures with me as we seek to become all that God has called us to be. And of course, uh, we are drawing to closed this morning a service, uh, a series, sorry, that we began called This Is Who We Are, This Is What We Do, where we've been sort of looking at some of the pictures in the New Testament uh, of the church. And, and we're, we're doing this because I believe that our identity determines behavior. I believe that the way that we see ourselves shapes and determines the way we, re we react. It determines the way we respond. If you have positive self-image, then you tend to be optimistic about life. Uh, you tend to roll with things well, and you tend to sail over things because identity determines behavior. Equally, if you have uh, poor self-image, then you tend to be uh, pessimistic. You tend to read into things uh, negative connotations because identity determines behavior. And in the same way, how we see ourselves as church shapes the way that we respond to to the world around us. And so often what happens is we think of church in terms of a building, in terms of service, uh, in terms of worship, and all those sorts of things. And even though we know in our head that's not true, uh, it filters into the way that we respond and engage with life. And so we've been unpacking these, these um, pictures that the Bible has of what it means to be church, to strengthen our sense of identity so that it, our behavior is more in line with the plans and purposes God has for your life and mine as his people. Uh, because in the Bible, the, the church is described in, in five ways in the, in the New Testament. It's described as a family. It's described as a body. It's described as a bride. It's described as a temple. And it's described as a lampstand. And each of these helps us uh, understand some dimensions, some facets, if you will, of what it means to be church. And, and it helps us in terms of our, our identity. We're all familiar with a family and with a body, and, and it makes sense to us in, in many ways. Uh, some of you may have heard people talking about the church as, as a bride, the bride of Christ. And, and we have pictures of what that means, and we unpack that some more to, get, to really just peel back some of the, the images and get to the heart of what that meant. And then we talked last week about the temple, about the temple, church being like a temple, and the temple was where God met with people. And, and that's what we are to be. We are to, to be a place where people can meet 
with God and your life and mine and our everyday conversations as well as our, uh, our, our coming together. People should be able to meet with God uh, through and in us. And we're sort of familiar with that concept. But the last one is sort of a little bit out there. Uh, when we think of lampstand, we tend to think of things like, you know, bedside lamps, you know, the lamp that sits on the, on the uh, end of the couch and all those things. But when the Bible talks of the church as being a lampstand, it's actually talking about something really, really powerful and, and really empowering for you and for I. And, and so I'm so excited to be able to uh, be, unpack this a, this a little this morning as we draw this series to a close. We first come across this metaphor of a lampstand uh, in the end of the Bible where John is having this revelation, this, this uh, dream, this vision, if you will, where, where Jesus is showing him what is to come and what it's going to look like at the end and through a series of, of revelations. And that's why the book is called Revelation, obviously. And right at the beginning, he has this encounter with, with Jesus. And it's a sort of, there's some things in it that really just sort of get him to question, like, really, like, I've never seen this before. What does it all mean? As you and I would sort of wonder if we were to meet Jesus in a vision that didn't, was outside of our normal experience, we'd be going, whoa, what is that? Why is that? What's this mean? What's that about? And we'd probably, like John, be too afraid to ask. And so in this vision, he's, he sees these lampstands and he, and he sees these um, he, he sees these angels and, and all sorts of things. And he's thinking, what is that about? And Jesus tells him in chapter 1, verse 20, he says, This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this is where this picture of the church being a lampstand um, comes from. It comes from Jesus himself. It's not as though one of the one of the apostles is likening the church to a body to a bride or things like this this is what Jesus himself is saying the church is a lampstand and when we think of lampstands we have a picture but for John and for all of the people who heard this vision who read about it it would have uh, had immediate significance that would have got them thinking beyond the everyday things beyond what they may have already thought because the the picture here of a lampstand uh, comes from a particular place in the Bible and it had a particular significance that we've sort of lost touch with over the years because we're not connected in the same way that some of those first century Christians and those Jewish believers were. The picture comes from when God led his people out of slavery and they were wandering in the wilderness and he created this tabernacle, this means for them to come to him and worship and he gives very detailed instructions. We talked about some of this last week uh, about how to make this and in the course of that this is what he says in Exodus chapter 25. So make a ha lampstand of pure hammered gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece. The base, center stem, lamp cups, buds and petals. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. Each of the six branches will have three lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. Crafts. Craft the center stem of the lampstand with four lamp cups shaped like almond blossoms, complete with buds and petals. There will also be an almond bud beneath each pair of the branches where the six branches extended from the center stem. The almond buds and branches must all be one piece with the center stem and they must be hammered from pure gold. Then make the seven lamps for the lampstand and set them so they reflect their light forward. You see, this is the lampstand that Jesus was, was alluding to. And this is the lampstand that John would have understood and, and all of the other disciples who uh, and the readers of that letter because the temple was, uh, was significant in, in the life of God's people. And, and even if they had been Gentiles who had come to faith, they would have heard and they would have understood what Jesus was was referring to. And so this p description, this uh, of this outline from from God of how to make this lampstand helps us understand something of who we are and what we do when the Bible talks about us being like this. 
And so let's unpack it for a moment to help us recapture some of our sense of, of identity so that we can live more fully uh, as, as God's people in this day. This is a picture of, of the lampstand. This is a, a replica. It's, it's not the original. It's based on the one that was in the temple before it was destroyed. This one stands two meters tall. We don't know in the Bible how tall it was, but we know how much uh, gold was used. And so uh, they've worked out based on the amount of gold uh, to make it st stand right to, to fit all the criteria that it would have been about that high. And the first thing you notice is that it's shaped like a tree. There's the center part that, that God spoke about. And here are the six branches that come out of it, all um, one piece. And, and here, it's, it's, this looks like a tree. And the description of the buds and the, and the leaves that, where it joins in and, and around the, the lamp part there, I think is a, they, it speaks of life. And think about this for a moment. Here's the lampstand that looks like a tree that's fruitful, that's speaking of life. When God created the heavens and the earth and he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what was at the center of it? The tree of life. So here in the wilderness where God is taking his people out of slavery and, and he's shaping them and molding them and preparing them for a, a promised land, here, right in the heart of, of, of the place of worship, is a symbol of life. You see, in the garden, at the center, there was a tree. And when in the wilderness, when they, the, the Israelites would camp, they would camp around the tabernacle so that it was at the center. And in that, there was this expression of the life that would come through Christ, who makes all things new. So right off the bat, when we hear this, this, this description of the church as being a, a lampstand, we should think of life. We should think of the Garden of Eden. We should think of hope. We should think of all of these things that are, that are represented by this, by this uh, lampstand here. And notice it was made of pure gold. It was not gold overlaid. It was made from pure gold. And it's easy for us to say, well, you know, nothing but the best is, is um, for, for our Lord. We, we give nothing but the best for, for God. And that's right. We're absolutely right. But this was pure gold because I think God wanted to remind the people of his inestimable value. That he is not like other gods. That he is a God who is pure, who is holy. He is different from us. You know, I think in today's world, we've become so familiar with, with God and, and with Jesus and our faith that it's almost like we've, we've brought heaven down and, and become so familiar that we've lost something of the otherness of God, something of the, the grandeur and the glory of God. And we've become a little bit too familiar at times with God. And so therefore, uh, we've lost that sense of awe in, in some ways. And yet, it was pure and holy to reflect that God is pure and holy. And the, the early Israelites understood that. They, they knew it. King David understood that. If God is holy, everything that he does is pure and holy as well. And that's why he says in Psalm, uh, Psalm 19, the laws of the Lord, that what God decrees because God is holy, everything about God and what he says is true. And each one is fair. And they are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They're sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the cone. And he goes on and he says this in Psalm 119, I love your commands more than gold, even the finest gold. You see, right at the beginning, the lampstand is a picture not just of life, but of the purity of life, of the holiness of God, the otherness of God. And it's a reminder to, to the people of who God is and as a consequence, who they are. That their identity, what gives them worth, is not just overlaying life with faith. It's not just life plus a relationship with God. It's God. And everything flows out of that. Your identity, your worth is, is, is not determined by, by just bringing God into your life. It's about bringing your life into God. God doesn't overlay things. He is 
everything. And that's how the church is supposed to be. But not only was it a tree, shaped in a tree, not only was it made from pure gold, the description that God gave was, was very detailed. He talked about how the lamp cups were to be like almonds. And it's very easy for us to, today in our context to just think of almonds as just another tree. It was Maybe that was a common tree back then. Maybe and, and just, we just gloss over it. But I think it was significant that God was very particular in saying they are to be like almond trees, almond blossoms. You see, the almond tree which is plentiful in the, in the Middle East. There's no question of that. But the almond tree is the first tree to blossom. It's the first. It's not, it's not the last. It's the first. It's, so I think there's some significance in that. So not only was the lampstand uh, a symbol of the tree of life, and everything that that means, that, that God has more than they currently were experiencing. The covenant was a covenant to release life. Not only that, it was made of pure gold because God is pure, the God is holy, God is just, and so are we through Him. But the lights themselves, the lamp cups, were set into almond buds. And we can just gloss over that and think, okay, it's just another tree. But I think it's significant because even though it was relatively common in the Middle East, the almond is the first tree to blossom. It's the first. Remember how in uh, Numbers 17, when the tribes were moaning against, Israel, against Aaron and Moses saying, you know, what makes you special? What sets you apart? Uh, we're just as good as, the, as, as you are. We can hear from God just as you, you do. And so God finally said, OK, tell them, each of the leaders of the tribes to bring their staff, which was a symbol of authority. It was a, each, each leader had a staff that represented their authority at the head and, and on it went. And so he said, bring those and leave them, leave them with me and come back in the morning and collect them. And let's see uh, who's budded. And that's a sign of, of um, my favor, my, my grace, my call, if you will. And of course, we know how Ar um, Aaron's staff not only budded, it produced almond fruit. Because God was calling them to be the first, the Levites, to be the first of the tribes. They were the ones who mediated between God and the people. They had a ministry of being first. But it also is the word that, um, that means to watch. And that's exactly what the Levites were called to do, to watch over the people. Moses was called to watch over the people. Uh, the, the Levites, the priests, were called to watch over the people. And again, so we see that in this lampstand, as in terms of you and I, we're beginning to see that there's, there's significance. It's not just a lampstand. It's speaking of, of our identity, that we, we have been grafted in and we represent a tree of life. And that we speak and represent the, the, of the holiness of God. We, we're supposed to reflect that in some way. And here we are. We are, to, we are first. We are to watch over those that are entrusted unto us. We go before so we can make a way for others. And notice, or you may recall in Exodus 25, how the, the lampstand it said was set forward. It was set forward facing the altar of showbread. If you were to see a schematic of the temple, and this temple was this huge complex, sorry, the tabernacle was this huge complex, and they would offer their sacrifice, and then the priests would come and, and, and wash, and they would come into the holy place where where there was the, um, the altar of showbread there and there was this lamp here and it was facing that. And that on that altar, that represented the covenant that God had with, with the Israelites. On that altar, there were 12 loaves, one for each tribe. And this lamp was facing it, reminding them of God's covenant, reminding them that God was watching over them, reminding them that the, that the life of God flowed into them through his relationship with them. That, that, that this lamp represented more than just light. It was the only light in that place. It was the light of God. Without him, it would be dark. Without the presence of God, without the covenant, their lives would be empty. They would be barren because there would be no life, which is what the tree represents. And on it goes. And the reason I say all this is, this is who we are. 
This is, a, this is what the church is when we talk about the church being a, as a lampstand. We are all of these things. We, we are reflecting the tree of life. And, and we are reflecting the holiness and the, and, and the purity of God. We are pointing people beyond the mundane and beyond what is broken, beyond what is to what could be. We are pointing beyond a life that is marred with, with everything that is corrupt and, and bad to a God who is good. We're pointing beyond the, the world as it is to the Garden of Eden and the world as it should be. That's, that's what we're about. Everything about your life and mine, everything about the church is about light, lighting up the world for God. It's about lighting a path for others to come into, into the fullness of life. It's about lighting the way for people to, to exchange brokenness for glory and honor and holiness. That's, that's why the, Jesus says the lamps represent the church. That's so much more than just a service, isn't it? It's so much more than just a building. You see, from the time of the fall when Adam and Eve were uh, kicked out of the Garden of Eden, when they were banished from the garden and from the presence of God and separated from the tree of life, until now, people walk in darkness. And they need light. They need you and they need me. They need the church to be that light. And every year we celebrate Christmas. We're, next week in the Christian calendar marks what we call Advent. It's the beginning of the preparation for Christmas. And every year in Christmas, here's what's going to happen. Around the world, churches are going to refer to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, where God says the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And we will talk about how Jesus is that light. Here's the fulfillment of that promise that in the darkness of life, that in the darkness of being separated from, from meaning, from purpose, from identity, from living a life without God, God is going to burst forth and bring light. And Jesus understood that. That's why in John chapter 8, he says, he says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. You see, just as the lampstand lit up the symbol of the covenant, that no matter where people were, that no matter what was going on in their life, God was with them and God had more for them. You and I are called to do that today. You and I are called to, to live in a way that brings forth life in other people. You and I are called to, to light up the way so that people can encounter the light of the world, Jesus Christ. You know, and I know that a question that might be formulating in your mind is that if Jesus is the light of the world, then why does the world need my light? You know, if Jesus is the light of the world, then why do people not look at him? Why do they need me to, to point? Because my light is nothing compared to their light. Remember back in the wilderness when God told them to build this, this tabernacle with this light that we've been talking about. God led his people as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. In other words, no matter where they were, there was this light that everybody could see that was leading them. Everywhere that people were around, they could just look and they would see this incredible light. And yet in the midst of that, God says, build this tabernacle and in it put a light that represents me, that represents the light of the world that's coming to shine in the darkness of life. Why did he do that? I think that, that you and I, if we're honest, sometimes things can become so big and so enormous for us, they overwhelm us and we, we just lose sight of of, of what's really happening and, and we just we need something personal we need something that we can relate to we need something smaller you know that's why at times even in a even during the day when you're looking for something you'll get out a torch you'll turn on the torch on your phone to peer even though the lights are on because it just it's personal it's it's there right where you need it it's focused and in the same way that's 
why you and I are called to, to light up the way and point people to Jesus. We're to live our lives as, as a, in a way that lights up the path, that points people towards Jesus. Because sometimes people need to experience the personal in order to understand the significance of who God is. That's why I keep saying that people need to see Jesus before they can follow Him. People need to see the light of the world in your life before they can encounter the light of the world for themselves. People need to see the day-to-day -day power of God transforming your life at work in your life in order to make sense of what is happening around them. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, as have you, no doubt, and read things online, as, as you have, no doubt, about how people f are feeling this year because of COVID. They talk about how they feel um, like they have been through a fire. They feel like they have been um, hammered, that, that life has just given them a beating, that they just feel overwhelmed and, and anxious. And because of that, what's happened is that here in New Zealand, we have had, for example, in the last six months, an 800% increase on Google searches to do with hope, to do with good news, to do, to do with faith, and to do with church. Because people feel like they've taken a, a hammering and a battering and a beating, and they've been through fire, and they're thinking, there must be more. What is the purpose? What is, what is the plan? And who better to answer that than you and I, the church? Who better to help them recognize what's going on in their life and what's happening around the world than you and I who have already been there? Because we understand what people are going through, not just from a worldly perspective, from a, a, an eternal perspective. You see, the gold that was used for this lampstand it was pure. It was refined. And you're not, you and I go through that same process. You know, we go through this process of, of being refined, of being purified. You see, Peter says that the trials of life, the things that you and I experience, they, they test us as fire tests and purifies gold. You see, gold was made from the earth, it was extracted, and it had to be beaten, it had to be hammered into shape. The gold that, they ca that came from the earth wasn't natural, uh, naturally shaped like a lampstand, it had to be formed. And just the same way, you and I are made from the earth, but our lives are tested and hammered, so to speak, by life. To strip away everything that needs to be stripped away so that what's left is pure and shaped by God. That's why in our next verse, he says, when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus' life is revealed to the whole world. In other words, what he's saying is that when people are crying out saying, I just feel overwhelmed, I feel like I'm taking a beating in life, what's going on? You and I have the answer. What's going on in your life is to bring you to a point where you can encounter life and life in all its fullness, when you can discover your real value, your real worth, because the other stuff is stripped away and your, your life is being purified. And as a consequence of you and I living that way and bearing witness to people, our lives will bring glory to God when Jesus returns. You see, it's not just about reaching the lost today. It's also about bringing honor to God tomorrow. Never think that what you do is insignificant. Everything that you do is lighting the way for others and bringing glory to God someday. You see, it's not until after we've been through things that people understand the process. That's why Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 15, No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. You see, because of what you've been through, you can light the path for others. In these days of uncertainty and anxiety, you can light the way for other people. You can help them make sense of what they're going for. You can help them locate themselves uh, against the backdrop of eternity rather than the immediate. 
and you can help them understand that what's going on is not a reflection of them. Their true worth, their true value is being uncovered through these things. And it's not, it doesn't consist in what they have. It consists in who God has made and called them to be. That's why Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians and says, we now have this light shining in our hearts. This is the light that's, that's come into your life and mine through going through this process of being fired, of being um, tested, of, of, of being refined. And we, and, but we ourselves like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Though through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. You see, when the Bible talks about the church as being a lampstand, about you and I being lampstands, it's about helping us understand that just as the gold that made the lampstand was refined and purified, you and I are refined and purified so that our lives point beyond ourselves to the light of the world. That the role of the church is to be a witness to, to Jesus through the way we live, despite what is happening around us. The, the way that we respond to pandemics, the way we respond to uncertainty, the re way we respond to, to stress and to persecution is helping us become who God calls us to be and speaks to a world that is looking for something more than it, the world can offer to a way to the light of the world. Everything about our lives should be about lighting up hope. And I, I, I quite understand that, that some of you, many of you, have been through the same process this year. You're feeling stressed. You're feeling like you've been hammered. You're feeling like you're overwhelmed and, and you're uncertain. And so it's only natural that you're saying, well, how do I find the faith? How do I find the hope to bear witness to others when I'm struggling myself? How can I, how can I tilt the light that is in me towards others? when I just feel so vulnerable and so fragile within myself. Well, if you were to read on in Exodus, you'll find that one of the things that the priest had to do to keep that lamp continually burning was not just bring the oil, but they had to trim the wicks. If you've ever um, lit candles before and then blown them out and lit them again, you know that the wick gets a little bit long and, and so you've got to cut it so that, it's, so that the, the, the wick is actually burning the oil cleanly so that the light is maximised. And I say that because to keep that lamp burning, they trim the wick in the same way that you and I need to, to make sure that for our life to burn, we need to stay in prayer. I think prayer is like trimming our wick. You see, we have this idea of prayer, of, of, um, of being like a shopping list, of, of coming to God, would you do this and what about this? And, and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but, but prayer is about refreshing our soul. Prayer is about cleansing our lives and, and, and cutting out the stuff that we don't need just as a wick is trimmed and refreshing us so that the light can burn no matter what's happening around us. You know, the book of Psalms is the prayer book of the Old Testament. And if you read, the, they're, all, they're all prayers. They're, they're, they're like prayers that are spoken or prayers that are being sung. And you see the anguish, but you see as they are real before God, how that anguish and that frustration, that hurt, that uncertainty turns to hope and turns into worship. If you're in that place where you are struggling and you think, I, I, I love Jesus, but, you know, I want to worship God, but I just feel so fragile. I feel so overwhelmed by life at the moment. Maybe you need to spend more time in prayer to refresh your soul. Not God, would you do this? God, would you do that? But, but just prayer, God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you know me. Thank you that even though I feel crushed and, and I'm not overwhelmed, even though, and you just pray the prayer that I just read out. And that will begin to refresh your soul because so much is riding on the church in these days. I believe so much is riding on the shoulders of those who would call themselves Christians. The last three weeks has about been helping us recapture our sense of identity so that we might recapture our purpose and live more fully out of the plans and purposes God has for His church in these days to be a light 
unto the world, to reflect Jesus to a world that is in desperate need of hope, to shine in the darkness of, of everything that is happening around people's lives, whether it be politically, uh, whether it be morally, uh, whether it be around the issues of the pandemic. People need light. And you and I are that. We are the lampstand. You see, if, here at ALC, if we are going to be a community of our hope for our city and beyond, we need to recover our identity. We need to be a bride. We need to be a temple. And we need to be a lamp that lights the way. Because when we, when we live out of that, everything changes. Your life finds meaning and purpose. And God is honor, glorified and honored in ways that just light up heaven. So as we come to the end of the series, it's time for you and I as we begin to look to a year ahead to start thinking about what changes do we need to make in our lives to better reflect these images, to, to more fully live out of the expression of these images as we seek to bring God's kingdom to bear. With that in mind, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your grace at work in our lives. I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us and, and help us to become all that you've called us to be, to recover our sense of who we are and to live more fully out of it. Lord, to live as a bride that, that, that stands before her groom, who defends and prays and intercedes and makes a way. Lord, that we would learn to be a temple, a place where people can meet with you, that everything about our daily lives would, would be facilitating meetings and that our lives as a church would be like a lampstand, lighting up the covenant of the cross of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lighting up hope, lighting up, Lord God, your holiness, out of which our true identity is discovered. So pour out your spirit and captivate us, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, as always, I hope it's been encouraging. I hope it's been helpful for you. If you've got questions, you can ask on slido.com. Use the hashtag ALC20. If you've got thoughts and um, observations, if you've got prayer needs, I'd love to hear from you. Hamish at alc.org.nz or you can post your prayer needs at prayer at alc.org.nz. Uh, this is, we're in this together. We learn from one another. So let's keep the conversations going. But until next time, God bless.